In this video, I'm going to give an overview of strategies and systems that may help you organize and use your time more efficiently to be more productive and to shape the life that you want for yourself. I want to emphasize though that these thoughts and opinions are very much based on one person's experience, mine, and is shaped therefore by the entire context of my life experiences to date as well as my personal values. You'll have to experiment and find your own path. But nevertheless, I hope you'll find a few things in this video that are useful food for thought and will spark your own journey of exploration. My own journey towards developing an organizational system started more than 15 years ago, when I was just starting a fellowship in a new country with a young family to take care of, and so lots of personal and professional responsibilities and commitments to juggle. David Allen's GTD, or Getting Things Done, was the first book I ever read on this. And it's fair to say, it changed my life. GTD is written like a DIY manual. He wrote a later book called Making It All Work, which illustrates in more depth how to put the principles of the GTD system into practice. Both of them complement each other. I like GTD principles because they are timeless and flexible, so I do recommend it as a starting point for thinking about how and why to set up a system for organizing your life and specifically for managing your tasks. Tasks are commitments to get something done, and we should honor our commitments as much as possible, which is the basis for our productivity and our reputation. So we need to have a good system of keeping track of our tasks and commitments. And our brain is not the place for it. Open or unfinished tasks and loops tend to occupy our short-term memory until they get done. What's key to remember as we develop our task management system is that to truly reduce our cognitive workload, it needs to be A, trustworthy, and B, low friction, or more simply, easy and convenient to use. We need to trust that the system will capture everything of importance and that this information will resurface at the appropriate time when we need it. The design of any filing or storage system should always prioritize retrieval and not storage of the item. The low friction consideration influences our design of the system and the choice of the tools we use to implement the system. There's no shortage of shiny digital apps or people telling you that this is the best one you should use. Everyone's brain works differently. Everyone's environment and workflow is different. So I'm not going to provide any specific recommendations for tools or apps, although I will mention some that I currently use. As a general rule though, I would say that for me, simple is better. I don't want to spend more time than I need to file, categorize, tag, or color each thought that I'm putting away into my system. I don't want to over-organize it. Remember the key objective is to just have the task pop up reliably when it's supposed to. Here's an overview of what the GTD system looks like. There are five basic steps. Capture, process, also called clarify, organize, review, or reflect, and then finally, do. We'll look at these in turn. Capturing is about taking thoughts out of our mind quickly and efficiently, freeing up your short-term memory and putting them somewhere where they won't get lost. It's recommended that you park them into an undifferentiated inbox or basket to begin with. It should be effortless to add so that you don't interrupt your flow, even as random but important thoughts pop into your brain, as happens to me all the time. The tools can be very simple. Stephen Wolfram, who's a noted computer scientist, uses a pen and folded piece of paper as his capture tool for fleeting thoughts and notes. And I do the same. I'm a scribbler by nature. This, however, does need to be eventually transferred into our to-do and information management system so that you don't end up with stacks of folded papers and scribbled thoughts, which again often happens to me. I like to use an app called Workflowy, which is based around infinitely nesting lists. It's clean, simple, works on both Windows and iOS, and syncs across multiple devices, all of which are important considerations for me. In addition to on-the-fly capture, it can be useful to also schedule a fixed time block for a brain dump of all the things in your mind. The important thing when doing a brain dump is not to spend too much time sorting the items at the time of capture because that can derail our overall flow of thoughts. Leave that to the next step in the process, which is making sense of all the items in our inbox. We want to clear it and categorize our tasks in a meaningful way. 
This is best done in a dedicated time block, ideally at the end of every day. And clarifying is the first step in making sense of all the thoughts that we've captured. Ask yourself these questions. Is it a fact or a piece of knowledge rather than a to-do item? If so, then archive it as a reference item in an information on knowledge management system, which we'll discuss later. If it's a task, is it actionable or meaningful? If no, then trash it. Now, if you're unsure, this often means that it might be a task that perhaps we want to act on at a later time. And it's useful to have a someday maybe list where we can archive it to revisit at some other time. If the task is actionable, then we will organize it. There are two things I find helpful in this step, which is thinking about the context of the task and how important it is or its relative priority. Organizing by context can mean a few things. The most important question I find as a medical professional and academic is whether this is something that is part of a larger project, in which case we should add it to the task list for that project and schedule another time block to tackle that project as a whole. We can also apply context by the setting or environment for our tasks. It might make sense, for example, to batch all our email tasks to do in one time block. Batching tasks to do around your home or when you're out running errands is another example. And a tagging function is available in most apps that allows us to filter by context and hone in on the tasks to be done. The second part of organizing is setting priorities for doing the tasks because we can only really do one thing at a time. And there are different suggested ways of doing this. One of the most popular is to use the Eisenhower 2x2 matrix of important versus unimportant and urgent versus non-urgent. Urgent is often based on whether or not there's a deadline or cutoff period to complete the task or project. Important usually depends on A, what the consequences are of completing the task or not completing it, and most critically, how it aligns with the overarching themes of our life. Alignment of our to-do list with our purpose and meaning in life is critical. In GTD, David Allen talks about getting perspective and he describes this in terms of looking down from different heights. At the very highest level, the 50,000 foot view, we should have a sense of our life purpose and the principles for living that we hold most sacred. At 40,000 feet, we should have a more specific vision about what a successful and meaningful life looks for us. At 30,000 feet, we want to have some defined and concrete long-term goals and objectives to work towards to arrive at our vision. And David Allen suggests a time horizon of at least one to two years for these. The next level down is the 20,000 foot view in which we have decided on our areas of focus. These are more specific areas that we're responsible for, are interested in, and that will help us get to our long-term goals. These can include roles at work, roles within our family and community, our physical health, our recreational activities, and our spirituality. Finally, we have the 10,000 foot view in which we have our list of projects that are related to our areas of focus. A project being a group of tasks and actions with a concrete outcome to be achieved. An important task should fall within this framework that we've defined for ourselves. And if it doesn't, perhaps it actually isn't that important. And related to that, there's one more step to take note of before we start doing, which is to review or reflect. This is critical to the success of the system, and it's one of the hardest to implement. We need to set aside a regular time, ideally at least once a week, to look at our perspective framework and ask ourselves, has anything changed in the higher perspectives? The Rad Read blogs by Kei Hai suggest two great sets of questions to ask ourselves as we do our weekly review. Alignment questions make us examine whether our current life activities warrant change based on how we're feeling. In North Star questions, check that we're heading in the direction that we want for our life. Those 40,000 and 50,000 foot views. We then come down to the 30,000 and 20,000 foot views and ask, are our projects still in alignment with these higher perspectives? Which projects are of highest priority? What do I say no to? Another useful idea from the Rad Reads blog for optimizing the use of your time and energy is the $10,000 per hour matrix, which suggests identifying and prioritizing work that has the highest leverage, the biggest potential reward with relatively little investment. 
and that only you with your specific skill sets can do. And these often turn out to be longer term projects and tasks that fall into the important but not urgent category of the Eisenhower matrix, which we tend to procrastinate on or ignore. What we really should be ignoring instead, or at least outsourcing and delegating, is any task that falls into that $10 quadrant. Finally, we get down to nuts and bolts, the ground level view of the weekly review. Have we defined next actions for all our projects? Are all our tasks and open loops organized or categorized into this framework? So I'll be honest, this weekly review can take a lot of time. And as I've said, it's often the most neglected part of GTD, but it's well worthwhile to ensure that we're truly working on the most important things in the coming week. The link that I've supplied has some useful tips on how to conduct an efficient weekly review. So now we get to the doing phase. We actually have to find time to complete all those tasks we've captured, organized, and reviewed. There are two common approaches to this. One is to maintain a to-do list and to go to it whenever we have time to identify what we should be doing next. The other approach is to enter all our tasks into our calendar and work from there. There are pros and cons to both these approaches, which are discussed well in this article that I've linked to. Note that many of the disadvantages cited for the to-do list can be overcome by the organization step we discussed earlier, assigning priorities and filtering by context so that we're not overwhelmed in the moment by looking at a list of 100 tasks. Nevertheless, I would say that one big advantage of calendaring at least some of our tasks and projects is that it allows us to block time off to work in a focused manner on them. I consider time blocking a very important strategy. The link here is the next in place to start exploring how and why to do it. One key benefit is enhancing focus. And focus is rapidly becoming a superpower because it's so hard to maintain. Carl Newport is a computer science professor and author of an influential book called Deep Work, which I highly recommend. And his core message is that to do any meaningful creative or knowledge work, we have to actively protect our, our attention and guard against distractions. And he followed this with another book called Digital Minimalism, addressing the issue we all struggle with when the very devices we're using for our work are also the source of our distractions. There are many tools and tactics out there for reclaiming your attention and focus, and you should experiment to find what works for you. The second big advantage of trying to calendar as many of our tasks as possible is that it helps to tell us if we actually have time to do all the things that we want to do it helps to stop us from overcommitting, Because a blessing as well as a curse of our modern life is that most of us have too many opportunities rather than too few. We have to pick and choose where we want to spend our limited time and energy. Learning when to say no is more important than ever. And that's not just with regard to work assignments, but also how we spend our personal and leisure time. It's easier than ever to waste the finite allotment of our days and activities that don't really hold much meaning for us. I presently use a hybrid approach for managing my tasks. At a high level, I use a to-do list to keep track of all my tasks, and I move some of them into my calendar if they're time-dependent or event-dependent uh, items. Most useful for me so far has been to schedule and protect blocks of extended time for high-focus activities. And as someone who tends to overcommit, I'm trying to use my calendar more and more to know when I should be saying no. One last thought on calendaring and time blocking comes from an excellent Tim Ferriss podcast in which his guest, Sam Korkos, talks about building slack into his day. And this means free or open time with no preset commitments. Because most of us are over-optimistic about how much we can do or how long something will really take or else something urgent always comes up, which derails us from our carefully planned schedule. He recommends that most people should keep 50% of their time open to act as a buffer, which might sound like a lot, but let me tell you from a very recent painful personal experience, it isn't. Sam Korkos notes that he personally leaves only 25% of his time is open, but that's only because he's highly disciplined and has also learned to be more accurate at predicting the time it takes him to do something. I think it's a great concept and it's one I'm working on trying to incorporate. So we've talked a lot about GTD as an example of a task management system. It helps us get things done, as the name says. But the other type of system that's useful, especially in this current world we live in, is an information or knowledge management system. 
Like opportunities, the blessing and curse of the modern world is that we have access to too much information rather than too little. Not long ago, I discovered the building a second brain approach described by Tiago Forte. I think that this complements the GTD system nicely. The building a second brain approach should be thought of as a system for managing all the information, thoughts, and ideas that come our way. By organizing our ideas and knowledge base, it helps us to define what creative endeavor we should be working on, how to shape it and work on it more effectively. So the overriding aim is to increase your flexibility of thought, generation of ideas, and thus meaningful productivity of knowledge-based work. Both the BASB and GTD systems have very similar steps. We want to collect or capture our thoughts and any information or knowledge that comes our way. If there are tasks, you process them into the GTD system. If there are facts and ideas, they go into the BASB system. Just like in GTD, we then want to organize and act on these facts and ideas. Tiago Forte talks about the action phase as distilling and expressing. I won't go into detail on these two steps except to say that when we're working with knowledge, as we do in our profession, to really understand a topic, we need to put time and effort into digesting the information and distilling it down to its core ideas and principles. This not only helps us to retain that information, but also to build on that knowledge and to link it to other topics. And with that, we can then express that knowledge in a meaningful and useful way, which may mean writing a summary note or article for yourself, teaching it to someone else, generating a research hypothesis, idea, or new clinical treatment, or simply refining existing ones. Within the code approach to building a second brain is a subsystem which is applied to the organized phase. And Tiago Forte calls this the para system or method. It's highly useful for organizing digital information because the same structure can be applied across multiple platforms. So that we have the same organizational structure in our documents folder for files, in our note-taking app for notes, and even our to-do list, which makes it easier to find related items when you're moving between different digital locations. P is for active projects, which are discrete collections of tasks with defined outcomes that we're currently working on, currently being the operative word. We should strive to control and limit the number of projects in this folder. So it's another useful way to prioritize and decide if we should be saying no to new projects and opportunities. And this list of projects should be mirrored in both the task and knowledge management systems. The knowledge management system contains the information and document files that relate to the project and help us to work on it and complete it. The A in para is for areas, which is what we have defined as broad priorities and responsibilities that we have in life. And this is identical to the areas of focus in the GTD system. Just like in GTD, this is somewhere we come back to periodically to review and reflect to make sure that our active projects match up with our areas of responsibility and priority. The R is for resources. This is where we store useful information that's related to any active projects or areas of focus. And broadly, this will include notes on any information and knowledge that we've consumed. Ideally, we won't have just copied and pasted this, but in the process of note-taking, we'll have digested the note and distilled it into its core content. Effective note-taking is a whole separate topic ripe for optimization and self-improvement, and these are links to a couple of excellent places to start going down that rapid hole. All I'll say here is that to really learn something, we have to put it into our own words. Extract the core ideas, reframe and re-express it, write it down, because writing is thinking. And best of all, go on and explain or teach it to someone. The second A in para is for archive. And this is where we dump anything that we have completed or are no longer working on. What we're trying to do is take it out of our sphere of attention. And the power of search functions in most digital apps means that we don't have to spend a lot of time on labeling or tagging them. We can probably find what we want to in the future by just searching keywords as they occur to us at the time. So there it is, my humble suggestions for developing a task management system and an information management system to cope with our modern life. As I've said, I deliberately didn't go into detail on specific tools or details of implementation because everyone will find one that works best from them through some sort of trial and error. 
I would just caution though against getting distracted by your tools or over-engineering your systems. The best systems and tools are the ones that minimize the friction of actually doing the work of information capture, organization, and retrieval. Making the to-do list should not take longer than doing the tasks. It's important to build the habit of using these systems and to do the deep work of actually tackling the tasks and the projects. Have a daily routine. It takes a lot of the effort out of doing the difficult things that are necessary for progress. Think also about managing your energy, not just your time, as you decide what to work on for the day. Try to accommodate your personal circadian rhythm for focus and energy and creativity, but also for rest and recharging. Don't underestimate the value of doing small things consistently. A little bit every day goes a long way. And this applies not just to our savings and investments, but also the accumulation of knowledge, wisdom, and health. And having defined our values, principles, and routines, stick to them in the face of daily noise. However, at the same time, keep an open and flexible mindset. Life should be viewed as a continual process of iteration and growth. Experiment and evolve as the tech, resources, and your own needs change. See what works, what doesn't, and gradually build the habits, systems, and tactics that work for you. Periodically engage in self-reflection and review to ask yourselves if we are still on the right path towards our life goals, if there's anything we can improve on or optimize in our professional or personal life. Finally, be careful, particularly in this world we live in, of who we give our attention and mind over to. There's a lot of fluff and misinformation out there, but there is also, more than ever, lots of inspirational wisdom to be found if we look in the right places. So I encourage you to read and listen widely, certainly beyond medicine and anesthesia, and even beyond your current personal interests, because you'll be amazed at what there is to discover.